Okay then, ladies and gentlemen. So. One second, what can I book? So the last time we were uh, having a class, it was actually way back on the 18th of September. And we had a look at chapters two and three and uh, speaking ethically and speaking confidently. And today we're going to be looking at A little bit more complex of a topic for second language learners. Uh, we're going to be having a look at uh, delivering the speech, and we're also going to be having a look at using language. Um, I think that using language is possibly one of the more challenging aspects of uh, this course, especially for uh, non English majors. Um, it can be a little bit difficult uh, to understand all of this uh, stuff, which is pretty high level. So we'll do a brief introduction. I've uh, modified the uh, presentation a little bit so I can look at the book a little bit more. But some of the key things that we have to think about uh, when we're communicating is that we, we need to keep directly translated Chinese phrases to an absolute minimum. We need to use concrete language that demonstrates thinking rather than relying on um, stirring people's emotions or um, persuading them or convincing them. And we don't need to do that in our introductory speech. All we need to do is we need to uh, show that we've thought about something, show that we've, uh, we're looking at keeping the audience in mind in communicating as best we can with them. We always need to use concrete language and we always need to talk about things that really exist. I'll give you a couple of examples um, about that um, from the book. We need to keep the language appropriate. That means that we need to think about the um, the level of politeness. There are, there are levels of politeness in any language. This is called the register of the language. And you need to think about, first of all, you need to maintain the same register, the same level of formality all the way through your speech. We need to keep our language consistent, so uh, we can't suddenly become very, very informal halfway through the speech, or we, can, we can't switch from formal to informal to formal to informal. We can't, uh, we can't really do that. We must choose, choose a tone, we must choose a register. And we must keep in that particular register, unless, of course, we're using language that other people have produced in the form of quotations. And then we'll be able to, uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't change what other people have said. What we need to do is we need to uh, make sure that our language is consistent all the way through. And we need to understand that writing is rewriting, that nobody writes a good speech in one afternoon. Um, nobody rehearses once and then gets it perfect. You will have to invest at least half an hour if you're serious about this. You will have to invest at least half an hour for maybe a week. Both critically analyzing uh, what you're saying in terms of you will record yourself. So you, the best thing to do would be to deliver the speech, record yourself giving the speech, and then get some kind of uh, feedback in terms of either you listening to the recording or having actual people in the audience give you feedback as well. So we need to understand that there's a process here. You, you, won't, you won't, nobody will ever sit down and uh, just think up a good speech. We'll, nobody will ever do that. Some of the types of language that we need to avoid in terms of um, tired phrases, in terms of uh, Chinglish that we always see uh, uh, every, uh, every semester, we have to put up with all of this um, 
really quite boring and uh, unimaginative and not very vivid, not very clear language um, with the rapid development of modern technology, as we all know. Every coin has two sides, last but not least, in a nutshell, in a word. When you say in a word, uh, the next word has to be just one word. So in a word, no. In a word, maybe. It cannot be denied. Well, most things can be denied. It depends on who you're talking to. Uh, broaden my horizons. You could think of something a little bit more specific than that. Since the beginning of time. Um, the beginning of time is uh, a fairly long time ago. More and more, and then an adjective, and then a noun, sorry. So more and more people, more and more students in the world, as opposed to presume on an, another planet and a colorful life. So instead of actually specifically saying, using language in a specific way, you go around and you say, uh, every coin has two sides, which basically means that every argument in the world only has uh, every idea in the world only has two arguments, positive and negative. Well, this simply isn't true. Things are a lot more, unfortunately, things are a lot more uh, complicated than that and a lot more nuanced with the rapid development of modern technology. Well, you need to be specific about what modern technology you're talking about. You're talking about medical science, you're talking about consumer electronics. You need to think about it and express that to your audience. Colorful life, you need to say, exactly how people will um, how people's lives uh, improve you need to think about what that colorful life represents and tell people that instead of just saying colorful life i don't know what colorful life means you might do it might be a translation from a chinese idiom i don't know i don't know what the original chinese is so you can't really say the uh, the english translation to it so try and avoid um being lazy basically um Try and think about what you want to express, and then get the words to express that. We want details. So the important, the int the interesting things are always the details in life. Um, it's uh, when someone just uses a, a phrase to end an argument or to end a discussion. It's very, very boring. We always need to aim to communicate rather than impress people or show off. So vocabulary is not actually a great part of any of the speeches. You do need to be clear in your communication. But what this means is that we shouldn't be looking at so-called professional language. We shouldn't be looking at big words. We shouldn't be looking at uh, overly technical words. So, for example, things that you see uh, on Wikipedia, if we just uh, if we switch around to my uh, faithful browser, we'll try and find a look at a uh, technical subject on Wikipedia, for example. So, for example, if we look at, uh, let's look at something like CRISPR. And then we'll be able to check the Wikipedia entry on CRISPR. Oh, there we go. So when you do your research, you may be tempted to use language which is just as complicated as what you might find here. Now, Wikipedia is, is uh, technically accurate, but you have to understand that very, very few people will actually understand what this, uh, what this uh, technical language actually means. So while you might think that everybody's been exposed to it, it really is quite difficult to, uh, to uh, understand, and it requires two or three different readings. So don't be tempted to just copy and paste this kind of stuff and uh, and in include this in your uh, in your speech um, mostly because it's it's too technical for really anybody and, and this is written by experts for experts and it's not really something that we would expect in a speech it is accurate it is technically correct but you have to understand that english is all about communication so when you're doing your informative speech for example your job will be to uh, educate people you need to understand all of this stuff so when you're choosing your uh, informative speech topic it needs to be a topic that you already understand or that you already think that you understand and just need to find out a little bit more about 
because if you go and you try and just repeat all of this stuff here, it's not going to help your grades because you've not made things very clear to us. So when you are actually teaching, the trick with teaching is that you need to understand all of the technical language, and then you need to be able to explain that in language that your audience will understand. So we really want to avoid the idea of impressing people with our technical language. Anybody can just repeat this. It doesn't take any special skill. Being able to uh, express all this stuff in simple language, which is really the, the main job of journalists and writers and teachers, to make all of this stuff um, actually accessible, then that would be the trick. So don't aim to impress. You always need to aim to communicate. Think how you would feel if you were reading this, uh, you, were, you were looking at a speech and someone presented all of this to you. It, it really wouldn't help your understanding at all. Um, we have, uh, I, th I think this is one of the times where um, people who've had, uh, especially people who've been educated outside of the Chinese education system, um, they don't feel stupid uh, when uh, someone is talking about something they don't understand. People get angry because they're sat down in front of a teacher who can't explain things to them and can't make things clear. So this is going to be part of your job in the future. It's also your job with the, with the introductory speech. You do need to communicate um, uh, ideas rather than try to impress people. We need to use familiar language. So we always need to use uh, everyday language. You get a feel for this by exposing yourself to more uh, English in your everyday life. So what you need to be looking at is you need to be looking at uh, English being used outside of a textbook. You need to be looking at uh, English being used in um, in newspapers, for example. You can find some very, very good uh, Chinese writers uh, if you're looking at uh, uh, a limited amount of, uh, obviously in China there's a limited uh, selection of uh, English news media available. You can use that, that's fine, but you need to get a feel for the language. And basically what you have to do with that is you have to get the, get the website and you have to be prepared to uh, use a dictionary to find out uh, the meanings of all the words that you don't understand. So reading the sentences will be important. Try and, uh, try and aim for something that you can understand maybe 95% of. But what you really need to do is you really need to get a feel for what is technical language and what is the everyday language. You need to start communicating in the everyday language because the ability to communicate is something which is more valued than just repeating what you find online. Remember that simple language does not always mean simple ideas. In fact, it never means simple ideas. Um, being able to communicate complex ideas in a simple way is a very, very highly prized um, skill. If we look at some of the some of the language teachers that I that I know, um, some of the best paid language teachers um, are able to explain language to people uh, and teach language to people by not using very many grammatical terms. So we, the more technical grammatical terms that we use in a language class, the less people will tend to understand. I know people that they will teach uh, at a company and they will earn, they will teach in about three days and they will earn $10,000 easily and very, very rarely use technical grammatical language. Memorizing the rules, memorizing the technical terms doesn't really help people do something. Um, if you think about uh, learning how to drive a car or learning how to uh, learning how to uh, speak another language, the more technical language that you use for this, um, the more difficult it is to learn how to do the thing. Um, so what we need to do is we need to communicate how to do something in simple, straightforward language, and that's really the skill. The problem is when you aim for this, when you try to do this. You have to understand the ideas inside and outside, all together, backwards and forwards, up and down, 
you need to be able to um, explain complex ideas simply many, many different ways so people will understand. So don't believe for a second that simple language just means simple childish ideas. It really doesn't. Some of the best teachers, some of the best writers are the ones who are paid the most for communicating complex ideas in a simple and accessible way. When we talk about uh, concrete terms, we don't use vague words. We don't use, um, you'll often find that um, people will never use uh, some or any when they're talking in concrete terms. When people use some or any, they're what they, more than likely they are um, trying to uh, be vague. Being vague helps you because if you're not really sure about what you're saying, it protects you a little bit. So it gives you, you know, 10% or 20% to be right or wrong. So that if in the future, it turns out that you're wrong, you can go back and you can, um, you can say, well, I was, uh, I was maybe 75% right because I used vague language. And you can't prove that I used specific language that specifically said that. Simply disagreeing or denying something is not helpful. Um, it's not one of the things uh, that we expect. As I explained in the first class, we do, expect, we do expect some level of debate or some level of discussion in, uh, especially people who've been raised in Western liberalist thinking. We have uh, this idea of discussion and debate where we don't blame people but we do expect the discussion to, uh, to move forward. The problem is that what we find is uh, a lot of people just simply disagree, or even worse, they just deny uh, something ever happened or something is going on. It's not helpful to be doing this. It's more helpful to be telling the truth. The more honestly you speak, the more interested your audience will be. So do make solid statements. Don't have this um, attitude that making solid statements is going to cause problems for you in the future. It's usually of very, very little uh, use to the listener, to your audience, if you actually say nothing. It's possible for you to say a lot of things without actually communicating anything. And that's poor communication when you just, when you just, uh, you use filler to um, say things, to uh, use the two minutes. And you don't say anything that is worth, uh, worth listening to. We need to avoid those tired phrases. We need to avoid being boring in our language. Talking about someone's colorful life is not very helpful. You need to talk about specific benefits for that person. There is a lot of preparation to be involved in. You need to demonstrate deep thinking. So that you need to demonstrate that you've actually sat down and thought about your topic and thought about what you want to communicate. Shallow thinking is not something that we would uh, encourage. It doesn't really help people in any kind of exams. When I've been uh, training people to do the IELTS exam or training people to do the TOEIC exam, we've always been focusing on demonstrating deep thinking. So whenever we look at the academic writing course, we've always tried to demonstrate deep thinking in our essays because we will be able to go back and critically analyze. And if someone hasn't been thinking about something and you're just repeating, first of all, you're repeating things that other people have told you are right. Well, those things aren't always right in all situations. So that's not very helpful. And the second thing is that you might actually be uh, writing things or saying things that you think people want to hear, which again is not very helpful because what people want to hear is often the least helpful thing you, you're going to tell them. So uh, we need to demonstrate that we've been thinking about this and this is where we need to think about preparation. So the two things that are outlined in the book um, are similes and metaphors. And 
I think if you saw the I have a dream speech, you will have seen a lot of these. You will have seen a lot of language uh, from the Bible, especially, which is uh, because Martin Luther King was an actual preacher. It was one of his jobs to go and uh, to go and talk about the Bible and to go and uh, use language from the Bible that his audience will uh, will understand because they were obviously they were from I think they were from the the south of uh, the uh, what they call the deep south so and um, the uh, American uh, Bible Belt is where the uh, a lot of people were deeply religious and spent a lot of time reading and rereading the Bible. So they were familiar with all of that language. So if you watch the I Have a Dream speech, you will have seen a lot of language and a lot of imagery that you're probably not very familiar with. And the same is true for you when you come to give your speech. You need to use similes and metaphors that your audience will understand. So if we have uh, metaphors, especially, they will depend on specific historical and cultural aspects of a certain language. If you just translate them from Chinese, then this will be uh, completely useless to your audience. Uh, you need to use metaphors and similes um, that are accessible to your audience and things that we've seen in English before. Even if we take something simple, uh, like uh, Xiao Ming went out in the rain and came back looking like a wet chicken. Anybody guess what we might uh, say in English? We don't say wet chicken when someone, when someone is uh, soaking wet from the rain. We don't say someone looks like a wet chicken. It is an animal, but what we say is that Xiao Ming went out into the rain and came back looking like a drowned rat. So we have some of these uh, even simple things like this. Uh, we actually uh, we actually need to be careful about um, the way that we're using language. If we turn to the book. We can see all this repeated all the way through the book. So uh, what we need to do, as it says on uh, in chapter 10, we need to use language accurately. We need to use language clearly. We need to use language vividly. We need to use language appropriately and inclusively. So we start off by um, looking at um, synonyms. Um, I think one of the you need to be careful uh, in uh, English as well because there are lots of uh, there are lots of words that do actually mean the same thing. Uh, sorry, lots of words that are spelled the same, but actually uh, fulfill different functions. So, for example, if you look at the word "have," the word "have" can uh, unfortunately have uh, one or two different but important meaning so if you say i have seen this film you don't use have as a verb the verb is seen have is used as a grammatical term meaning uh, the present perfect sense i have seen this film before so uh, you don't tell people exactly when you've seen it but you use have to say that sometime in the past i have seen this film you can say, I have a computer, where the uh, w verb is have. So we have the word have, a very simple, common, everyday word that we see all the time. But it has two very, very important distinctions. We also have adjectives that end in ed, or adjectives that end in ing. And you need to be careful about how you're using uh, these words. So you can't say, I am boring. You can say, I am bored. But you can't say, I am boring. You can say, the teacher is boring. I am bored. That would be acceptable. But commonly, what we'll see is a lot of confusion of these terms. Someone would say, I am boring. Again, with uh, adverbs, you must be quick. 
or you must be quickly. You need to be able to uh, make the distinction between those that um, you can't say you must be quickly. You have to say you must, you must be quick or you have to be quick. If you use, as uh, is uh, mentioned here in the textbook, you, you use a thesaurus, you will actually have a book of synonyms. You will actually have a list of words. It's a dictionary of synonyms. This is not a teaching tool. It's always a bad idea to use a dictionary and a thesaurus to learn from because they're supposed to be references for things you already know rather than for things that you don't know. So you need to make sure, first of all, that you, that you know the words before you look them up in the thesaurus. The thesaurus will help you choose alternatives and keep your language interesting, but uh, you need to make sure that you actually know how to use the word to begin with. At the bottom of page 38 and the top of page 39, you will see another very good example of how it's a bad idea to just repeat the research that you find, the language that you find on the internet. The language on the internet um, reference websites, um, you may well uh, see it as more professional in language, you may well see it as more impressive language, but oftentimes this uh, technical language that we don't use every day is going to have a more negative impact on your speech. So if you have uh, maybe talking about, um, I think this is talking about um, mothers who drink. If you're using too many obscure words that we never really use in everyday speech, you can imagine what the effect would be. The delir deleterious effects of alcohol on the unborn child are very serious. When a pregnant woman consumes alcohol, the ethanol in the bloodstream easily crosses from the placenta from the mother to the child and invades the amniotic fluid. Thus, it can produce a number of abnormal birth syndromes, including central nervous system dysfunctions, growth deficiencies, a cluster of facial aberrations, and variable major and minor malformations. So while we may be able to understand that the deleterious effects is, is negative effects, um, we don't really get a good sense of what people are talking about. The language is technically accurate. But uh, being technically accurate is just uh, one third of the actual public speaking experience. It's much better to say in more simple, uh, accessible terms. When the expectant mother drinks, alcohol is absorbed into her bloodstream and distributed throughout her entire body. After a few beers or a couple of martinis, she begins to feel tipsy and decides to sober up. She grabs a cup of coffee to aspirin and takes a little nap. After a while, she'll be fine. But while she sleeps, the fetus is surrounded by the same alcoholic content as its mother had. After being drowned in alcohol, the fetus begins to feel the effect, but it can't sober up, it can't grab a cup of coffee, it can't take a cup of aspirin. For the fetus's liver, the key organ in removing alcohol from the blood, it is, not, it is just not developed. The fetus is literally pickled in alcohol. So we have um, a lot more straightforward, simpler language. But we also uh, use uh, more engaging language like pickled in alcohol or the fetus is drowned in alcohol. So then we have these, these images, simple, simple images that make things more, uh, more interesting. So at the bottom it says that uh, Winston Churchill advised people to use short, homely words of common usage. If you use big words, big technical words, uh, then you're going to have uh, you know, real problems uh, communicating with your life, communicating with your audience. So what we need to look at is we need to look at the idea that we have a Latinate language here. So we use, um, so in, in English we have um, we actually have um, a lot of French, a lot of uh, um, old Latin, old Greek words. These big words, these technical words, these uh, impressive words, um, they actually made it into the, uh, the English language because uh, we used to have a French king. When I say used to have, I mean, 
in 1066, we have a French king. So it became fashionable uh, to speak in French words. So we would have uh, people trying to give the impression that they were highly educated by using the same language as the uh, kings and the upper classes of English society. So then we have words like expectorate, uh, which was from the French, uh, which we could have easily just said spit, um, perspire, and perspiration, or in English, the, uh, the English word that we have, the Anglo-Saxon word is um, sweat. The problem with these French words is that they are quite long. Um, anybody who studies French um, will kind of uh, be uh, struck by how formal French, everyday French, seems to be. So people don't really, especially if you're uh, an, a native English speaker, it's kind of strange for you to see French because French certainly seems to be a very, very formal, high-level language, um, simply because um, in English, we have a lot of um, these familiar words like spit and sweat, which is what we use in English and possibly what people use in uh, German and Swedish and Danish. They don't use these in, uh, in French. Uh, they, they actually uh, they use bigger words, they use longer words. Um, it just became fashionable to use them in English society. What you'll see, uh, a, a strange, confusing thing, that you'll see in English is that you'll actually see some people using, uh, when they write, they actually use um, the English and the French uh, together. I'll give you an example. I just lost my... Uh, give you one example. You can get the annotation to work. So we will have, for example, Um, freedom and liberty. So uh, a few hundred years ago, it became uh, a common English writing uh, habit to put uh, the French and the English together in terms of adjectives. So if you go back a few, you know, five or six hundred years, you will see people writing about freedom, which is the uh, which is the English word. And then they will actually, um, liberty actually means freedom. So when, you, when we write freedom and liberty, we're literally writing freedom and freedom. But to, uh, to add a little bit more color, a little bit more interest to uh, the adjective, uh, we actually just uh, started using uh, the English word, the English adjective. And, uh, and the French adjective, just to make things a little bit more interesting. So uh, things can actually creep in. The use of French and English can creep in in, uh, in some uh, unexpected ways. It just became uh, the fashion. Uh, you, you need to actually read to be, able to, uh, to be able to grasp this and understand this. What you should do is you should look out for any words that end in T-I-O-N-C-A-L or A-B-L-E. Um, these are all the French words. Uh, there are a few more. Um, but anything that ends A-B-L-E is a French word in English. So table is table. Uh, comfortable is comfortable. Um, C-A-L, economical, uh, is just economique in French. Um, political is politique in French. We just had problems with the eek, so we just changed it to al. So uh, changed a little bit. And t-i-o-n, all these uh, t-i-o-n nouns that you see. Information, uh, that's a French word. Information is just the way that it's, uh, it's just the way that it's translated. Preparation, preparation, perspiration, perspiration. So you'll often see um, A-T-I-O-N as well. So that will be, uh, these will all be French words uh, in English. Try and avoid the use of these if you can. Um, you're, you're leaning towards more technical Latin language uh, whenever you use any of these words. Obviously, a thesaurus will help enormously with, uh, with that.
So going back to the book, to move on, talking about concrete words, if you're wondering about how you actually choose the concrete words. Well, there's a nice handy chart here. You do need to do some thinking and development of your language. So physical activity, we would say that this is too general. We would say that this is too abstract. We need to talk about something more concrete. So sports is getting a little bit more specific. Basketball is even more specific. The MBA is even more specific. And then LeBron James is the most specific thing that we can talk about on this topic of, uh, of base, uh, basketball. Sorry. So we go from, we don't tend to talk about um, abstract or general things. Um, we, you might hear them in everyday conversation because people, people will often struggle to, uh, to uh, you know, talk about the incredibly detailed and incredibly specific thing. Remember that public speaking is not a conversation, though. So we always expect people to uh, have done their preparation and to be able to talk about things in specific and concrete terms. So we talk about things that we can touch. We talk about things that really exist in the real world. We don't talk about abstract ideas or abstract con concepts as much as we can. Um, it often shows... Um, a laziness. It also it often shows a, a lack of uh, thinking. Um, remember, you need to do demonstrate that you actually have been thinking about this topic. As you uh, prepare your speech, as you uh, as you uh, look at refining your speech and improving your speech, one of the things that you can do is you can eliminate clutter. We can e eliminate, as we, t as we say, we need to eliminate redundancy. So um, you might get things in, uh, that make perfect sense in Chinese. But sometimes we, we just don't say in English. So for example, you might um, have a sentence. The wheel of the tire, for example. Um, we don't need to say this. So you'll be able to say that the wheel of the tire, we can just say the tire. Because the idea of the tire already has the idea of a wheel with it. So we don't say the wheel of the tire was deflated uh, on my bike. You can just say the tire on my bike. Um, so we don't need the wheel of the tire. We can just say the tire. So a good example of how things uh, redundancy can be um, Redundancy can be uh, uh, eliminated. You do need to um, go over and over your speech and make sure that you're actually um, saying the words. Make sure that you're, um, that you're uh, being comfortable with saying the words. It's, it sounds a little bit strange, but oftentimes um, you just need to repeat things two or three times to become comfortable with a certain phrase. But um, a lot of times a certain phrase will not work that well. And you do need to just remove it as, as best you can. So don't try and impress people by using uh, lots of words when you can just use one. So um, you can see um, supporting, we can just say, we can instead of saying giving her support, we can just say someone is supporting. Instead of saying ended up becoming, we can say became. Instead of saying in this day and age, we can just use today. So we look for conciseness. We look for um, um, a brevity, brief ways of saying things. But we don't lose any of the exactness in the language. Um, English is a Germanic language. Um, it's from the German family of languages. And languages from that family tend to be quite specific in their expression. So, um, using vague language, using lots of words when one word will do. Uh, we tend to aim for the most concise and we tend to aim for the most brief. We don't tend to aim for um, lots of words being used as you might, um, you might find in, uh, in other languages in Europe. Using language vividly, again, there's lots of ways that you can actually technically and accurately express something. There's no guarantee that that will actually be the best way to express something 
in a speech. This is where we see some of the art of public speaking. Uh, this is the artistic side of it, the creative side of it. So Barack Obama once said, yes, we can. And he had this big, long speech. He could have said, giving up is something we cannot do. We must continue to persevere as Americans have always done historically. Only when we work hard can we solve our problems. We must be positive. What he actually said was completely different. He actually took his slogan, his idea, yes, we can. And he actually applied it to different situations um, throughout American history. So we've been told that we're not ready or that we shouldn't try or that we can't. Generations of Americans have responded with a simple creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Yes, we can. So there's, he, he talks about all these different things. He talks about the founding of the, uh, the, American, uh, the American country, writing the Constitution. He talks about slaves and abolitionists, freeing the slaves. Yes, we can. The immigrants that arrived in the, uh, in the 1920s and the 1930s, People said to them, yes, we can. Talking about justice, talking about equality, talking about equal rights, for the, uh, both for uh, Native Americans and for um, uh, the black slaves, descendants of the black slaves, we see this idea, yes, we can. We see people improving their lives, uh, having more opportunities and becoming more prosperous. Yes, we can. So it's, you can see, even though the first one is actually, uh, it's actually kind of, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just not very interesting. So when we talk about the art of public speaking, we actually talk about how are we going to uh, impress upon the audience a certain idea. Metaphors and imagery. Um, one of the things that we need to avoid doing um, which I, I see a lot of, is that we don't really tell people how we feel. We shouldn't tell people how we feel. We shouldn't try to describe how we feel. When we're talking about um, describing, we should always talk, think about the, uh, the physical senses. We should always think about what we can hear, what we can see, what we can smell, what we can touch, and then describe those. So we very rarely describe the emotional aspect. We very rarely tell people what we're feeling. We never, we never say things like, you can imagine how I felt. What we have to do is we have to work a lot harder with our language and we have to go in and um, describe a situation accurately um, so that people will have their own emotional reaction. You don't tell people uh, how to feel. The idea is that you need to create a mental impression using the sights, the sounds, uh, the physical sensations, the smells, the tastes, and you actually need to create an um, emotional reaction from the audience using that um, vivid description. So one of the things that can improve your descriptions is to avoid talking about emotions and feeling. And what you should do is you should actually choose um, emotive language to describe the physical sensations of an actual um, of an actual uh, actual situation that you find yourself in. Finally, I look at uh, simile. Simile uses like or as. There are no set similes. A lot of the similes that we do find that are set are actually quite boring. So the ones that the similes that people, for example, learn in high school are often the most boring similes, try and think of your own. All you need to do is compare two things. They might be different, but they will have some characteristic which can be applied to both of them. So for example, virtue, like a strong and hardy plant, takes root any place. So we're comparing virtue with a plant. A word once spoken, like an arrow shot, can never be retracted. So a word is like an arrow. Obviously, they're not similar in very obvious ways. But by creating similarity through an interesting way that people might not first think of, you can actually make your language much more interesting. 
the way of truth is like a great road. It's not hard to find. So we compare truth with a great road. We always use like, 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 or as, 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 when we're using similar. So think of what two things uh, might be, uh, might have a similar characteristic, even though they're not physically similar. Some of them might not actually physically exist. So truth doesn't physically exist. A word doesn't physically exist. Virtue doesn't physically exist. But then you can actually use things that do exist and show people how they're similar. Metaphors are words in pictures, as I mentioned. Art is the torch of a nation's spirit. So art is not literally a torch. But the metaphor, the image that we can create, is that uh, art is the torch of a nation. It, it shows that it casts light on things. It, it puts new meaning on things. With globalization, the same sea washes all of humankind. We are in the same boat. There are no safe islands. So uh, we, uh, we, we make the... Uh, I think this has been uh, used quite a bit. It's quite a well-worn, well-used uh, metaphor. The idea of uh, uh, humanity being the sea. The idea of um, uh, countries being islands. Um, we are all in the same boat is, is quite a common expression as well. If you look further down the bottom uh, of this page, you'll see uh, Al Gore's uh, speech where he compares global warming to a fever. So the earth has a fever and the fever is rising. The experts are told this is not a patting affliction that will heal by itself. So you can have these extended metaphors which go on and on. Um, obviously, the idea that the earth is sick, um, the earth could never actually be sick, but it's it's a useful way of uh, a useful way of um, creating immediate understanding for the audience that doesn't necessarily understand the technical aspects of uh, of global warming. Rhythm in your speech. This is one of the reasons why you have to practice your speech and listen to yourself saying the words that we do have a, have a certain rhythm in English. There's a certain um, uh, way that we put stress on words and a certain speed that we speak at. Um, so you can actually hear the rhythm in some things. We cannot tell what course of this fell war will be. We cannot yet see how deliverance will come. But nothing is more certain than the than every trace, than that every trace of Hitler's footsteps, every stain of his infected and corroding fingers, will be sponged and purged, and if need be, blasted from the surface of the earth. So, Churchill was a very, very powerful public speaker, and he was always uh, he was always using, um, always adding things and taking things away to improve the actual feeling, the sound, the music of the English. So, if you look at the last. The last two lines will be sponged and purged, and if need be, blasted. So you've got these um, sponged, purged, and then a, the sound of blasted. The TD is a, very, is a very strong final sound here, and it fits in with the rhythm um, all the way through. So think of how you're going to deliver something. Think of how um, Martin Luther King did, delivered um, his speech. He always had a definite rhythm, and he slowed down, and he said certain key words very, very definitely. A few more advanced devices towards the end of this chapter. Um, parallelism is one thing you can use, where you put three things uh, in sequence, and these three things that describe the thing we've mentioned, they are not more or less important than anything else. So the first example that we have here, the battle is not to the strong alone, it is to the vigilant, the active, and the brave. So we have three groups of people, vigilant people, active people, and brave people. And they are just as important as the strong people. So this is what we mean by parallelism. So we have strong people in the battle, we have vigilant people, active people, and brave people. And they're all just as important or just as good as one another. When you see something where the parallelism is somewhat um, badly, uh, uh, badly done, I speak as a, a Republican, I speak as a woman, I speak as a United States Senator, 
I speak as an American. Well, we don't really get the meaning of what she's trying to say here. So she's just saying, I'm speaking as all of these different types of people. To actually add emphasis to the parallel, um, to the parallel description, we can say, I speak as a Republican, I speak as a woman, I speak as a United States Senator, and I am also addressing you as an American. So just the phrase, and I am also, um, ties everything together and makes everything relevant all of a sudden. So Republican, woman, United States Senator, and I am also addressing you as an American. So being all of these things, there is no better or, uh, better or worse. They're all just as important as each other. So we say that these things are in parallel, and this is parallelism. Repetition, we will see this a lot. We will see this, uh, yes, we can. We will see, um, you saw it, I have a dream. He repeated the same thing over and over again. I have a dream, I have a dream, I have a dream. That was the point of the speech, that it should have been a reality. All of the things that Martin Luther King was talking about should have been real. But instead, even in the 1960s, a hundred years after uh, the slaves had actually been uh, released, uh, given their freedom, uh, it was still um, something that they were still dreaming about even then. Alliteration is simply choosing uh, words because the first letter or the first sound is the same. Peace is essential for progress, but progress is no less essential for peace. So we have this per, per, per sign. Nothing great is accomplished without cooperation, compromise, and common cause. So we have k, 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 k. This is alliteration. Um, uh, choosing an adjective, choosing a noun uh, that all begin with the same sound. Finally, antithesis. This is a little bit more complex to do. It, it can be really well, uh, a really nice device if you can use it. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. So it's a juxtaposition of uh, two contrasting ideas that most people will be thinking well, what can you give me? And people really should be asking themselves, what can I give you? Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. So we have this juxtaposition again, this antithesis, negotiate, fear, fear to negotiate. So some nice, uh, it's a little bit tricky to do this, even for native English speakers. Don't feel bad if you can't do it or you struggle with this, but it's a very, very nice uh, way of getting across an idea. Finally, when we give our speech, we need to make sure that we're using language appropriately. So we use the occasion, we use the audience, we think about these things. We have to think of the topic and we have to think of the speaker as well. So when we talk about um, the occasion, we need to think about um, whether it's a formal or informal occasion, what kind of language can we use? When we think of the audience, are we talking to an audience which has no prior knowledge of the topic that we're talking about? Or are we talking to um, an audience which will understand all the technical language? Nine times out of 10, you will be talking to an audience which does not understand the technical language. So you could never say someone had a fractured fibula, but you would be able to say a broken leg. You should always aim for the, um, for the simpler English, for the familiar words, rather than the technical language. But you do have to consider the audience and, how, uh, and, and whether you can actually use the technical language. Think about the topic. If you're doing an informative speech on how to change a car tire, you wouldn't be using a lot of metaphor and simile. You don't need to use that. It's a technical subject. It's a practical how to do something uh, speech. So you don't need to use a lot of imagery in that. And finally, think about yourself. Think about how comfortable you are with, uh, with the language. Um, if you find yourself being a little bit uncomfortable, either remove it or try and find another way of uh, expressing uh, that, that uh, particular idea. If you have a look on the top of uh, 148, 
page 148, we have a checklist um, which summarizes uh, all of the ideas that we've looked at today. The answers to all of these questions should be yes. Uh, by the way, I don't know why they've put no, but um, make sure that you're, um, that you're answering yes to all of these. It will help um, critically analyze your own speech. If you ever answer no to any of these, uh, you need to be uh, thinking about uh, going back and changing, uh, changing the language um, uh, that you're using. So when you're analyzing your speech, use this checklist as a guide. And then all of your answers should be yes. None of the answers should be no. Finally, we move on to something which is, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because it changes uh, very rapidly. The last few years um, has changed very rapidly when we talk about inclusive speech. Um, and I'm not really an expert on it. Try to avoid he. Try to avoid he or she. Try to use they. So whenever surgeons walk into the operating room, they risk being sued. So don't use he or she. It sounds a little bit awkward. Don't use he because that's sexist language. Um, mankind instead of humankind. Or if you are specifically talking um, from a, a feminist point of view, womankind, you can use. Um, all human life is better than all of mankind. Businessman, you can use businessman, businesswoman, but generally speaking, if you want to talk uh, in general terms, business person or business people. Uh, don't use uh, what we might call politically incorrect language like crippled people, handicapped people, or even better, you could say people with disabilities. So we don't really talk about crippled people because there's a certain negative connotation with that. What we need to look at is using either handicapped people or people with disabilities. So think about how those two people talk about themselves. Similarly, we don't really use stewardess anymore. We would use flight attendant um, and we just use actor to describe male and female actors and actresses uh, considered a little bit, um, uh, a little bit old fashioned, a little bit sexist. All right then, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that is a fairly lengthy coverage of using language. It is quite an important aspect of uh, giving speeches, um, which is why we spent so much time on it. And um, please do make sure that you've read through the chapter. Um, do we have any questions before we move on? Do we have any questions? We're going to have a look at delivering the speech very briefly. Um, just have a look at extemporaneous language and exp extemporaneous delivery. Do we have any questions about language before we move on? Okay, so we'll move on to uh, looking at these uh, different types of delivery. So delivering a good speech, um, you have to understand that the way that we're teaching you is the best way. Um, the best reaction, the best response, the best experience that you can have from, uh, so we'll, we'll call it an American audience for, uh, for now, um, is to deliver a speech in an extemporaneous way. So this is a more natural uh, conversational aspect to giving speeches. It is not reading from a manuscript. It is having a conversation with the audience rather than at them. So we have an element of interactivity. We make sure that we maintain eye contact with individual people in the audience just to make sure that we're communicating with them. We speak naturally. 
um, we don't shout. We don't need to. Uh, we don't need to project our voice to the back of the uh, to the back of the room that we're speaking at because we usually have microphones to to help us with that. There's things that we, with our voice that we need to be aware of, like um, rate of speech and volume. Um, we'll have a look at those later on. And body language. So using your hands, using your face, using uh, using your entire body as we saw with the tap, tap, tap uh, speech. Um, we, we expect people to be using all of these things. We have three different, uh, sorry, four different types of uh, delivery. That is uh, impromptu, which is where you have little or no preparation. You can have a memorized speech. You can read from a prepared manuscript, which we try to avoid at all costs. And we can deliver extemporaneously using an outline or uh, using notes. We always need to build, we always need to make sure that we're speaking honestly with the audience and with sincerity. Oftentimes, what happens in a in a, a group when people are in a group, um, then what we'll actually find is that people will be able to um, detect people. Um, they can somehow start to detect lies um, far more uh, effectively um, when they're in a group. So when someone says this guy is, is lying, um, it becomes suddenly more obvious that you're lying when you're giving a speech for some reason. You should always be looking to develop your own style. Um, you can actually start off by you know borrowing a style, trying to imitate someone, but you'll often feel much more comfortable delivering speech in your your personal style. Aim for a conversational style, aim for uh, an informal, relaxed style. Um, we want to avoid um, distance and a feeling of coldness um, from the speaker. When we're reading from a manuscript, you need to deliver it exactly as written. There are lots of situations where this is important. For example, in political situations where you want to avoid offending people and causing an international incident, you need to make sure that you follow the, um, the, follow the script as it is written exactly. One of the tricks with delivering a uh, speech from a manuscript is that you have to avoid sound, sounding like you're reading it. So the more that you sound like you're reading it and the more badly that you prepare for it, the more obvious it will be to the audience. Um, first of all, it doesn't sound really sincere. So you need to uh, make sure that you're able to deliver, even if it's from a manuscript, you need to make sure that you're able to maintain eye contact with the audience. So you will need to memorize some aspects um, of the speech. This won't be a, a problem if you rehearse, rehearse and rehearse. You can actually use a manuscript to work towards extemporaneous delivery. So if you're feeling that you don't really have the ability to uh, deliver a speech extemporaneously, start with the manuscript and then work towards delivering the speech, relying on the manuscript less and less. So you'll need to do a lot of preparation with this. Oftentimes you'll have two pieces of paper. You'll have the uh, manuscript and then you'll have your notes. And as you deliver the speech from the manuscript without relying on the manuscript more and more, you will actually make notes on the, on the parts of the script, parts of the speech that you need to remember. So there might be a part of the speech where you really struggle, you just make notes on a separate piece of paper, and then you'll be able to work towards delivering extemporaneously. As always, you need to think about the audience first. Um, don't just think about what you're going to write in the script to tell to the audience. Make sure that you're actually thinking about the information that you need to give to the audience and write down as if you were speaking to them. Memorizing your speech, you can either uh, memorize the whole speech, which is something I don't recommend you do because it's very easy to forget the speech. All you need to do is to forget the first word of the speech, and then all of a sudden you'll fail to remember the whole speech. Or you can look at the, uh, the parts that you need to memorize. 
um, for example, quotations um, or bits of evidence from other people, and then be able to deliver the speech um, uh, extemporaneously. Uh, but you will, for example, if you go on a tour, if you go on a sales uh, presentation, you might be giving the speech a little bit uh, differently each time but the important parts will be memorized so the important technical aspects a lot like my my uh, lectures here were each class is a little bit different but the important parts um, i always remember to mention to people remember that you'll be always uh, be a little bit more interactive with your audience when you uh, deliver a speech which is memorized rather than from a manuscript but the problem is because you'll be more focused on remembering the words, it can actually take away from your performance um, on the stage. So you might be focusing far too much on remembering the next part of the speech rather than actually you know, using your body, rather than actually um, presenting yourself as being open and accessible to the audience. Again, you need to write the speech, you need to memorize the speech, think about what the audience needs to hear, uh, don't think about what you should be telling the audience. Think about what you should, what the audience needs to hear in terms of explanation. How would you do it? If you were having a conversation with a friend, write down um, that way instead, instead of um, being as formal as possible. Extemporaneous speaking, this is what we need to aim for. You're in control of the content, you're in control of the main points, but you're giving a lot more flexibility. You want to be more natural, you want to be more conversational, and you want to be more spontaneous. Extemporaneous speaking is the way to do that. Why does this thing keep freezing? Sorry. If there is a Q&A, so there will be an impromptu speech where there will be a question and answer. We won't have a question and answer session uh, for the informative speech or the persuasive speech on our classes, simply because there isn't time. Um, but what you might find is that uh, Q&A will help actually help give direction to your speech. So if you do deliver an extemporaneous uh, presentation or an extemporaneous informative speech, um, you can actually, um, you'll be actually uh, use the audience um, to help explain things more. So don't feel bad if you forget something because the Q&A will also, uh, will you be able to fill in the gaps using that. Make sure that you're, um, you're able to organize your speech either in topical order or chronological order. We don't mix these two together. So you don't have half, half of a topically ordered speech and then half of a uh, uh, chronologically ordered speech. Um, you need to be. You need to understand the the three. The you know well two different ways that we've looked at. We're going to look at uh, spatial organization later, but um, topical organization and chronological organization. You can't mix those two together. You can't start off with a chronological uh, uh, speech and then suddenly change to. Uh, it's changed to uh, discussing the individual topics. Um, make sure that you know the difference, make sure you know how they work. Um, look at chronological starts with the earliest and goes to the most recent and topic. We never repeat ourselves in the topic. So we, we mention one topic and then we never discuss it again, except in the conclusion. So you have to be um, you know, aware of how these different topics work. Impromptu speeches, um, this is a so-called, uh, you, you can think of this as a so-called elevator pitch. Uh, an elevator pitch is uh, something that happens in Silicon Valley, where uh, you'll be in a lift with someone like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, and Jeff Bezos will say, um, so what's your job? You have to be able to answer that question in 30 words or something like that and explain to people uh, what your job is. So when you go to a, a social event, or when you go to a, uh, um, you know, uh, maybe a, a sales uh, presentation that you're giving as part of your company, someone asks you a question, you don't just say yes or no. 
you have to actually be prepared about uh, how to answer that question. A lot of times you will hear the same question repeated again and again. So you'll be able to um, develop a so-called elevator pitch, um, speaking for you know a minute, 45 seconds, answering one simple question like, what's your job? Or what do you do? Or why should we choose you? That would be your elevator pitch. Making notes uh, in the top section C at the end of the semester, you will be given between eight and 10 minutes to make notes. Remember to spend time on organizing your thoughts as well as writing down the actual content of what you want to say. You need to maintain eye contact, you need to speak directly. Oftentimes in the impromptu speech, um, you'll probably find it better to work harder on creating a closer relationship with the audience uh, rather than a more distant one. Um, it's it's going to be um, a pretty informal event, but you need to give the impression of being more relaxed speaking impromptu. So um, speaking more closely with the audience is a good idea. Uh, when you're talking in a, in a formal event, you need to think of um, what your comments are going to be and you need to make sure that your comments are limited to the occasion itself. Um, you can use things like internal summaries and transitions. Um, we'll talk about these later in the uh, informative speech uh, preparation. But these will, uh, transitions help you uh, to move towards the conclusion without simply saying firstly, secondly, and thirdly. Transitions will help you to, uh, to review and preview for your audience. We'll take a look at this in more detail in the informative speech. Remember in the Q&A that you actually have to listen to what people are asking you. And you actually have to uh, make sure that you understand the question. So you may wish to repeat certain parts of the question, or you may wish to involve parts of the question in your actual answer. If you're outside of the exam room and you don't know the exam, don't know the answer to a question, uh, make sure that you find a way of getting in touch with the person who asked that question in the first place and giving the answer to him or her. When we talk about vocal variety, we talk about volume, rate, pitch, use of pauses, articulation and pronunciation, and uh, dialect, uh, which can add vocal variety to your actual language. Volume, things can go louder or uh, quieter. You can get things uh, more intimate by whispering or lowering your voice. Be aware that if you're using a microphone, um, you'll need to accommodate that in your delivery. So it's always worthwhile practicing your speech on the actual stage that you'll be giving um, so that you're actually familiar. Um, we don't really need to shout because you'll be using a microphone. So um, for some of these speeches, you'll be using a microphone because it's the only way that I can hear you. Um, please make sure that you're not speaking too loudly because, um, you know, if I'm wearing headphones, then that's going to be a problem. You can show strength with a louder, stronger voice. You can show weakness by um, having a, a lower, quieter voice. You can create a more intimate atmosphere by uh, reducing the volume. It sort of kind of brings people close to you as they try, to, uh, they try to hear what you're trying to say. Don't overdo this. It's very, very easy to um, whisper because you're terrified of speaking in public. Um, please make sure that you're uh, speaking loud enough for everybody to hear. You get this uh, through practice. That's the only way that you can get it. You can speak faster, you can speak slower. Positive emotions are normally uh, expressed through more rapid speech. Important parts of your speech, you can slow down and emphasize those parts. Make sure that it always fits in the rhythm of the speech. Remember, you should always be looking at sentences rather than words. So fit the rhythm, fit the, um, fit the emphasis and the slower rate to the overall uh, rate of speech for the whole uh, segment that you're saying. Be aware that you often speak quickly. 
because you're in a hurry to finish. Speaking quickly is a sign of nervousness. So even if you don't want to speak quickly or slowly to emphasize certain points of your speech, be aware of this because when you're speaking quickly, it's normally a sign that you're nervous and you might need to consciously slow down or else you'll be finishing your two minute speech in uh, one minute, 20 seconds. And uh, that's, uh, that's a bad thing. Pitch, you can go higher or lower. Remember in the uh, My Life with Sign Language um, uh, speech, whenever she was talking about her grandfather would say something, she lowered the pitch of her, she lowered the pitch of her voice to emphasize that it was a man who was speaking. So men will speak with a lower voice, a lower pitch than women. So you, if you want to imitate a woman, then you can, you know, uh, and you're a man, then you can raise the pitch of your voice. Uh, wouldn't recommend that that could be uh, interpreted as being uh, offensive. As you get used to speaking, as you get used to different ways of delivery, people will often um, uh, fairly unconsciously use different patterns of pitch to give uh, different meanings. So, for example, um, when people talk about a child complaining, they will often use a higher pitch. A higher pitch is normally seen as um, being particularly annoying and whining, almost like a baby crying. So you can use that to actually um, kind of, you know, give an impression of childish complaining. Remember that you can apply pitch to uh, exclamations. You can apply um, pitch to a group of words. You can apply pitch to an entire sentence to change the meaning of, uh, of the actual sentence a little bit. What we should be doing, however, is we should be avoid speaking in monotone, speaking with one tone, speaking in a single pitch with no variety in that pitch. Make sure that you're using pitch to add vocal variety. Martin Luther King used pauses a lot. Pauses give em emphasis to information. Pauses tell the audience that the next piece of information is going to be important. Pauses can be used to help an audience process and think about what you've just said. So when you tell a joke, for example, you might just want to leave a pause so that people can actually, you know, understand and smile at the joke. Repetitive pauses, unnecessary pauses, filler pauses, false starts. We want to avoid using words such as like, you know, so. So, like, you know, if we repeat these things all the time, this is uh, very, very annoying. Um, try to avoid it as much as possible as you practice. So again, the value of recording yourself and listening to yourself and then being able to um, eliminate the filler words and the filler pauses, something that you would uh, find extremely useful. New words that the audience might not be familiar with need to be articulated clearly so that they can understand and hear every part of that word. So we may change the stress, we may change the rhythm, we may change the tone on different syllables of the word um, to make sure that the, uh, the audience can actually hear and mentally spell the word in their head. We need to articulate things very, very clearly. Generally speaking, try to work on pronunciation. So obvious pronunciation issues like um, this instead of this. You need to make sure that you're pronouncing the th sound instead of the s sound. There was a great German. Um, there's a great German English school called Berlitz. And the um, one of the ways that they advertised this school was they had a German guy and um, he would say, what are you thinking about? Instead of what are you thinking about? And no one could understand why he was saying thinking about. Um, don't say uh, gonna instead of going to. Don't say wanna instead of I want to. 
this is okay for conversation, but wanna and gonna should never be used in uh, essay writing or speech giving. It's far too informal. It's far too conversational. Things frozen up again. Make sure you get a dictionary with the actual recordings of the word so that you're able to practice the pronunciation. This is, this is fairly standard now. So you really have, uh, you know, no excuse. Think about how you're going to dress. Think about eye contact and facial expressions. Think about your movements. Think about your gestures. And think about how you're going to incorporate the visual aids into your speech. So you don't need to go out and buy um, an expensive suit, but you do need to be sensitive to, uh, for example, if you're giving a speech in Saudi Arabia, for example, um, you may need to think about how you're going to dress. Um, business, Western business styles are pretty much, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of the, the most basic formal dress that you can think of, a shirt and a tie. Are, uh, are are pretty much uh, standard throughout the world. So if you're ever if you're ever uh, wondering about how you should dress, um, browsers suit browsers shirt and a tie would be um, a good idea. Thinking about your body language, crossing your arms in front of you, clasping your hands in front of you. If you're sat down, crossing your legs. We want to avoid this closed posture. We want to make sure that we're open, so we have an open, uh, wide stance. The way that we stand is important. The way that we uh, have our hands open. Uh, it's very, very difficult to do this if you're worried about speaking, but um, try not to do much with your hands, which tells subconsciously and non-verbally tells people to go away. We shouldn't be doing this. Think about the occasion, think about the culture of the country that you're in. Think about what visual message you're uh, sending. Your eyes, uh, human eyes, are an interesting uh, creation. If we have a look at the human eye compared to uh, other apes, We can see that we can see an obvious difference. Um, a gorilla's eyes, this is one of our closest relatives, the chimpanzee and the gorilla, they actually have dark areas to their eyes. Where the other apes have dark areas, we have white areas. And this makes it much easier for us to see what the other person is looking at. So, somewhere uh, in our history, we've evolved. Communication through our eyes. Um, gorilla, uh, chimpanzees' eyes are black. They don't really uh, communicate much through their eyes. But our eyes, there's a large portion of it that is white. It's very, very important that we use eyes, that we use eye contact as part of our communication. We can actually move our eyebrows as well, which um, uh, we don't really see with chimpanzees and gorillas. So eyes really are. Um, an almost secondary uh, non-verbal uh, way of communicating with people. And we need to use that eye contact in a positive way. Um, don't stare at the ceiling all the time. Um, remember that different cultures have different rules for eye contact, um, and you need to be aware of that. We can make different expressions uh, and emotions with our face. If you're sending a text message to somebody, we use a smiley face, a happy face, or a frowny face to actually soften the message that we're saying, that we're delivering. It's a very, very um, uh, blunt way of humanizing text messages. Um, human faces can express nearly 10,000, more than 10,000 different expressions. Smiley faces, frowny faces, uh, crying faces, vomit faces. We have all of these. Um, because the human face is a key part of communication. Your body language, the action should suit the word and the word should suit the action. Remember that repetitive and unnecessary movements 
can be seen as negative and they can um, distract the audience from your message to so avoid pacing, avoid um, any repetitive, annoying, annoying gestures. Make sure that we focus on the message first. The gesture is the physical secondary uh, message that we need to get there. So think about the message first and then the gesture. Oftentimes you'll be doing this uh, subconsciously anyway. Um, even, even while I'm delivering, uh, you know, this this class now, I'm still using my hands to, uh, to uh, even though you can't see me, I'm still using my hands to um, help my brain think. Make sure that the audience can see your hands. Make sure the audience can see uh, your visual aids. Um, hold your hands at, at least waist height if you're standing up, and make sure that you've got somewhere to put your notes and how you're going to handle your visual aids. Okay. All right then, ladies and gentlemen. So that is about it. Just to wrap up, uh, do we have any questions that people need uh, addressing from today's two classes? I know that it's a lot, but we need to give you a lot of information straight away so that the later classes we have more. We have, uh, we'll be spending less time on this in later classes. So any questions, any problems? All right then, ladies and gentlemen, so uh, do remember that uh, the next class will be, uh, we'll be giving our introductory speeches. I'll just get the uh, syllabus up for you. So we're starting on the Thursday classes, we're starting the, uh, the first of the introductory speeches.
So let's see. Uh, yep. So chapter 10, we are on uh, 27th of September here. Uh, September 30th, then we've got our, uh, that's Thursday class, and then uh, October 11th, uh, we should be looking at, uh, that will be the fifth week, so we've got that to uh, look forward to. Please be aware that there might be uh, another set of makeup days, I think, is coming up um, after, um, actually after the, uh, the National Day, I think there's a makeup day on the Saturday as well. Uh, please make sure that you're having a look. Uh, we're, we're gonna have, we don't really need to start looking at this, but um, we're going to be looking uh, in the next uh, in the next three sessions after the introductory speech. We'll be looking at speaking to inform. Please be aware that there is a uh, quiz as well. Um, so after after October holiday, after the National Day holiday, there will be a quiz based on the chapters that we've looked at. So chapters 10, 11, 2, and 3, and chapter 1, that will be the basis of the first speech um, after the National Day holiday. But uh, for right now, that's all we've got time for. Good luck with preparation, uh, the preparation of your speeches. And um, I guess we won't see each other until after the National Day. Um, so please do enjoy that. Um, check the calendar for the makeup days. I think it's something like the 9th of October. but um, do check the calendar for that, and I'll be looking forward to seeing your speeches, uh, as I always do. So thank you very much indeed, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.